Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Winkler again. This is the World War I class. And I believe today is the fifth lecture. I'm having a good time. Looking forward to the day. Looking forward to the lecture. I hope you are as well. Whatever you're doing, whatever you have planned, I hope it works out for you perfectly. Well, we're getting heavily into the, into the First World War now. Now, we haven't started the fighting yet, but that's going to be around the right around the corner. I'm following up the last lecture. We're actually getting to the point where now we're going to be discussing the assassination of the Archduke. And the assassination of the Archduke is going to lead to an international crisis, and this international crisis is going to lead to war. So this is what we're, what we're going to be discussing today. Well... I talked to you last time a little bit about the Black Hand, an Apis, an assassination group. Can we say they're Serbian ultranationalists? They want a greater Serbia. They want access to the sea. To do this, they want to destabilize the government of Austria-Hungary because they view Austria-Hungary as their major threat to all of these ambitions. I've always wondered about assassination groups. You want to accomplish something. What if your assassination leads to war? What if the, what if the assassination leads to war and your country's destroyed in the process? That is clearly an, a possible outcome. As we talk about the course of the war, in 1915, Serbia is destroyed. However, since Serbia's friends, France, and Britain win the war, Serbia is able to reconstitute itself and have the great Yugoslavia, which many of them wanted. However, you can see from Apis's death in 1917, he was actually executed. He uh, does not live to see this happen. So when you destabilize a foreign power, there is a real possibility, is there not, that you're going to get your fingers burned more than you're burning somebody else's fingers. Well, that doesn't make any difference to them because they want to make a statement, a very important statement. They want to get the ball rolling, even though it might not roll in the right direction, to achieve their ends. Now, we're talking about the assassinations, assassination group, the black hand. Api sends these his henchmen, if you want to call him that, to knock off various people in various places. As I mentioned, there are some assassination attempts, 1910, 1911, and 1914, which are really unsuccessful, but they keep trying. Now, Serbian officials take the members of the Black Hand. Remember, now they're going to go after the Archduke, and they take these Serbian officials, Serbian officials, I said that wrong, Serbian officials take these young assassins. They give them guns, okay, you're using 38 caliber revolvers. Now, I was raised in the Utah gun culture. I mean, you have to train people to use guns. I mean, it's kind of like teaching you how to ride a bicycle. You hop on and you go kind of thing. Well, these men have to be trained. Rapid fire, short distance, accuracy. So they give them guns, they give them training. So they know how to use the weapons, and they know how to hit their mark at close range. How long does this take? It doesn't take very long. But these are Serbian officials. One of them is actually an officer in the Serbian army. Something else that the Austrians do, excuse me, I said that wrong, the Serbians do, they falsify papers. These men are in Serbia. They've got to get the get across the border of Austria-Hungary into Bosnia. In order to do that, they have to have papers. They have to have they have to have a passport. Well, if you're applying uh, for permission across the border, you're not going to get it unless you have falsified papers. So once again, these Serbian officials falsify papers. So these young assassins can get across the border and attempt to kill the Archduke. 
How does this make Serbia look? Let's go back over here. Need to get all the way over here at the end of the line. This makes Serbia appear culpable, does it not? That at least Serbia was involved directly in preparing these men for the assassination. And now if, if Serbia is culpable, can we say that they are involved in the assassination? So this assassination becomes an official act of the Serbian government. As I was trying to explain last time, however, just because a person is a Serbian official does not necessarily mean they are acting with the approval of the government. You can be a Serbian official and do something on your own. That does happen. But the question is going to be, these people are Serbian officials. Did Serbia, first of all, know of the attempt, which now we do know that they did know? In fact, they did send a brief warning to the Austrians saying, by the way, there might be some assassin, assassins running around. The Austrians didn't pay much attention to this because, sure, there's always somebody running around. But once again, at what level did the Serbian government know? And what level did the Serbian government either approve or try to get this pushed forward? This is, this is something that's debated even among historians, even today. All we're sure of, however, is that Serbian officials were involved. The question of higher government acquiescence is still something that is yet to be fully explained. The reason why I'm making a big deal over this is the Austrians are later, when they start doing research on this, they're going to f decide, well, my goodness, the Austrians, the, excuse me, I keep saying this wrong, the Serbians were involved. Well, let's look at the assassin himself, Gavrilo Princip. He's a young man, what? He's not even 21 years of age. When he's caught, he's literally caught on the spot, but when he's caught and interrogated, and he finally gives information that includes this information, which I was telling you about before. Train assassins give them guns. I should mention they had bombs too, that the Serbian officials gave them. And they got the, got the falsified papers. According to Austrian law, you cannot execute a man even for murder, unless he's 21 years of age. Princip is not 21. He, you, you can't assassinate him. This led, and these are these are cockamamie ideas, but there, but even during the war, even shortly after the war, when so many people try to find the Austrians and Germans so viciously involved in creating this war, they even go so far as to suggest, oh, because they didn't knock him off, they didn't care as much, didn't execute him for his crime. They even go so far as to suggest maybe Prince Sip was actually working for the Austrians, which is absolutely absurd. But he does die. He does die in prison at the age you can see here in 1918. Now, he has tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is one of these debilitating diseases. It's a lung disease, as you all know, uh, a lot of coughing. And it's a degenerative disease in the fact that over time, you're, it gets worse and worse over time, uh, it'll kill you. And sometimes the process takes years. Obviously, something that kills you a lengthy period of time is, is torment. Now, there is no cure. However, if you have a chance of surviving, and rich people do get, powerful people, people with resources do get tuberculosis, about the only thing they can try to do for you is to simply have you cut down your activity to the point where you're just laying around. You're laying on a bed, you're sitting in a chair, if that. You don't go out for walks, you don't go out for a promenade, any of that kind of thing. You might have a chance of survival, or at least it might prolong your death. You see, Princip is poor, he's a young man. He doesn't have access to wealth. He can't sit around for years on end hoping that he will get better, die more slowly. He's going to die. 
and he really has nothing to lose. Going to die anyway. Let's go out with a bang. That's a bad pun, isn't it? I didn't mean that. Let's go out having made a statement that I want to expand Serbia's power. Let's look at his target. Should we get Gavrilo Princip up here? Gavrilo Princip. These are photographs taken after he was arrested. Okay, Francis Ferdinand. This is his target. Why Francis Ferdinand? Well, Perhaps he's just nearby. It's easier to get to him in Bosnia than it would be to sneak around all the way back to Vienna and try to kill other important fishes. One of the great ironies of this situation is that among the important rulers of Austria, <clears throat> Francis Ferdinand is a peace advocate. We have other people, see the guy right down here, head of the army, Conrad von Hürzendorf. And Conrad von Hützendorf is something of a hothead. He's the one who says, look, Serbia means it's no good. We, we really need to find a reason to go to war and go in and take them out. Because as long as they're there, they're going to continue causing problems. Francis Ferdinand says, no, 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 no. I don't want to do these kinds of things. We don't want to get involved in a necessary war. I don't want to foment action. The irony is that had Ferdinand not been assassinated, or had he lived the assassination attempt, he might have been somebody, might have been, he might have been somebody that would have not pushed for war, and maybe he would have pushed for peace. Well, he's the heir to the throne of Austria. When the emperor dies, He's going to rule Austria. I, I don't know um, if you why you want to relate him to a modern political figure in the United States, for example. Do you want to call him a president elect? But see, a president elect in the United States is quite a bit different than his situation. Because no, he's not technically ruling right now, but he will. My goodness, the emperor is 84 years of age. You know, that's way, way exceeding life expectancy. Now, we know in retrospect, he died in 1916. Made it all the way to 86. My goodness. From that time frame, he's well exceeded his life expectancy. Because he's exceeded his life expectancy, you could guess that any, any he could be gone tomorrow, literally. So before the emperor has died, Francis Ferdinand is taking over some of the reigns of state. He's starting to, to become heavily involved in government. And he's the peace advocate. Francis Ferdinand kind of has an interest in history. Because the emperor's son and heir had died earlier on, I believe he committed suicide. In any event, Ferdinand is not the son of the emperor. Now, he's a little bit of a bad boy. Uh, he's not well loved for a number of reasons. One of the most important reasons is that when he marries, he marries for love. You see, he's of the highest levels of Austrian nobility. He is a Habsburg. And he should, he must actually, marry somebody who is of the same level in society. In other words, the highest level. And he falls in love with Sophie. He could choose to, I guess, have Sophie as a uh, mistress and be formally married to somebody else. <clears throat> He's too moral for that. He wants to marry her. He loves her. They have children. Now, the emperor is really quite upset about this. Oh, my goodness. You rotten kid. Look what you're doing to our royal family. 
while the emperor cannot take Francis Ferdinand out of the line of secession. You know, he will rule after him. But because he had married, Sophie's not nothing. She's kind of lesser nobility, but she's not high enough. So the emperor says, look, the emperor is Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph says to Franz Ferdinand, look, if you marry her, I'm going to, we're going to shun her. And they do. When they get married, everybody shuns her and she can't go to public, public affairs. And, and when she shows up at places, people have a tendency to remove themselves from the room. You know, this, this is rude to say the least. Most importantly, Franz Joseph says that the children that Franz Ferdinand has through Sophie will be blocked from the secession. In other words, Franz, jo Franz Ferdinand can become the emperor, but his children cannot. That's, that's kind of a pretty good jab, isn't it? Now, we have to speculate in this direction. Had Franz Ferdinand been alive in 1916, when Franz Joseph died, then all he would have to do is say, oh, by the way, <laughs> I'm reinstating my children as to be the line of secession, in other words, my eldest son will follow me. So let's get Franz Ferdinand up here. Got too many... See if we get the right ones. We've got too many people here. Okay, it's Franz Ferdinand. Let's get him, him with Sophie. Not a terribly good picture of her. She's kind of cut out. Let's get her up here a little bit. And here is Franz Ferdinand and Sophie, the day of their assassination in Sarajevo. What on earth is Franz Ferdinand doing in Sarajevo? And can we ask ourselves another question? Why, of all the people you could perhaps assassinate, does Apis and the Black Hand want to come after him? Apis and the Black Hand believe he's more dangerous than just any public official because he's trying to make nice with Bosnia. <clears throat> By that I mean he, he wants Bosnia to be happy being part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So he's trying to put money in there. You know, better roads, better school, better infrastructure. Now these people enjoy the rule of Austria. If he's successful, then the Bosnians say, well, I'm fine living in Austria-Hungary. I don't have to jump over and be part of Serbia. So he's, he's, he's more dangerous than just being a high official. Okay, well, what is he doing, doing down here? Well, he's, he's trying to be a nice guy. Um, it's one of the few places he can actually go in public where his wife won't be shunned. So they're going to go down to Sarajevo. <clears throat> Uh, to a public, to a state, state meeting. Yeah, important person to go down there and let's show off. He's trying to show that he, he likes the local people. The choice of the date is unfortunate because a few hundred years before, this was a date of an important defeat where the Turks actually conquered these local people and took them over. He ignores that rather than thinking that, well, maybe I can wave the flag and get a little bit more support. Now, there's another reason why he's down there at this time frame. There's military maneuvers. The army and the reserves are called out in the summertime. They're called out in the summertime, and then they go out and they do play the little war games. And he wants to be down there as a leader of the nation, and he's going to oversee what's happening here. So this is a state visit, trying to, trying to look good. <clears throat> okay, Austrian officials start making some mistakes. They publish in the newspaper the route which he's going to take. In other words, they're going to be a nice, they're going to be a motorcade, you know, a bunch of people, and a bunch of dignitaries in various cars going down the road. They're going to go down approximately this time down this road. There are six, seven assassins in the Black Hand that know where they're at, know where they're going to be, and they're lined up along the road. Okay. They have pistols and they have bombs. When Sophie's and Franz Ferdinand's car comes pulling down the quake, pulling down the road, 
one of these assassins takes his bomb, he arms it, and he tosses it toward the car of Franz Ferdinand and Sophie. I have two different accounts of this. Some say it just bounced off the top or the side of the car. Another account says, because the car was open, it's a warm day, you don't want to, there's no such thing as air conditioning. You don't want to, you want to have a nice breeze, so you don't want to have <clears throat> the top of the car up. According to this other account, that the actual bomb was closer to Franz Ferdinand, that he actually batted it away with his hand. It does not go off by their car, but it rolls back by another car in the motorcade. It goes off, and the bomb injures a couple of people. It doesn't kill anybody, but they're injured. Of course, these people are going to be taken to a hospital, a hospital nearby. Now, the motorcade goes all the way down to downtown Serbia, downtown Sarajevo. And in downtown Sarajevo, they meet with the, the public officials. Franz Ferdinand, he's, he's upset. You know, he's, Wait a minute, I come down, meet you people, I get met with bombs. That's pretty upsetting. Well, they go through the emotions uh, of this meeting. See, Franz Ferdinand's trying to be a nice guy. Let's go to the hospital and visit these people who are injured by the bomb. Now, the drivers in the motorcade think that the best thing, and they're right, and other people think this as well. Let's just get out of town. Let's just get in to avoid any other possible problems, any other assassination attempts. Get in, put the hammer down on the car, take off, and just burn out of town. That makes sense. Now, after the first assassination attempt, Gavrilo Prince still got his bomb, still got his pistol. Well, what's he going to do? Well, it's Sunday, but he goes over. There's a shop that's open. Goes over and buys a sandwich. Have a, have a little bit of meal, right? And he just happens to walk out of the sandwich shop. He's eating his sandwich. Walks out and he's on the street. When Franz Ferdinand and the motorcade are now pushing past. Now there's confusion. The drivers of the cars have not been perfectly informed exactly what they're supposed to do. The driver, Franz Ferdinand's car, Franz Ferdinand's car, assumes that it's going to boogie out of town. However, the other cars start turning over because they're going to go and visit the hospital. He gets confused. He realizes he's going the wrong direction. He stops the car. Now, once again, which book do you want to, want to believe? One book said the car he was in did not have a reverse gear. So it was difficult to angle off. Another car said, another book, the other books say that he was trying to get into reverse gear, nah, got to grind it in, get the clutch in, these kind of things. Whichever case is correct, the car comes to a dead stop right in front of Principe. Like here to the wall. You couldn't miss. 10 feet away, 30 feet away. It's so close. So he pulls out his 38 pistol and fires two shots. He said later who he was trying to kill was Franz Ferdinand and the mayor Sarajevo was in the same car. If that was true, he was one lousy shot because one bullet hits Franz Ferdinand and the other bullet hits Sophie. Let's get assassination of Franz Ferdinand here. Let's see if we can get some photographs. Here we are in town. I already showed you that one. The one I was hoping to be able to show you fairly easily, and maybe that's not going to be the case, is when they arrest. This is a fanciful idea of actually what had happened. There is a photograph literally taken within minutes, if not seconds, of the assassination attempt, where they're, where they're showing that uh, the police are grabbing the uh, principe and arresting him. In, in any event, he pulls out the gun and fires twice. The first bullet, actually we're not sure which was first, one of the bullets goes through Sophie's abdomen, probably cutting a bunch of arteries in the process. 
she dies very rapidly, probably bleeding to death internally. He turned, Franz Ferdinand turned to her and said, Sophie, Sophie, don't die. Live for the children. But she died very rapidly. The other bullet went through Franz Ferdinand's neck and cut his jugular vein. In a museum in Austria, they actually have the car that he was in when he was assassinated. <clears throat> and they have the clothing that he was wearing on display there. There was blood all over the place here. Now, the driver now is heading to the hospital as fast as they can. Because there's any chance to save this man's life, they're going to have to have, to doctor, have, to have a doctor there very rapidly. As he's bleeding out, one of the men in the car said, Your Royal Majesty, are you in pain? And he says, oh, 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 it's nothing. It's nothing. Last thing he said before he went into his death rattle and died. So both Sophie and Francis Ferdinand are dead at the same spot at the same time. Let's ask yourself some questions because it's the crisis over this assassination that is going to lead to war. Can I ask you a question? Let's go up here. If a nation kills your president, will you go to war? Now, at this time frame, there are assassinations. If we go back to 1881, the Tsar of Russia, say Alexander II, the Tsar of Russia was assassinated. He was assassinated by kind of a local kook. Yeah, they wanted to stabilize the government, but there's no connection to a foreign power. If you have no connection to a foreign power, who are you going to go to war against? I remember well in 1963, the assassination of John Kennedy. I remember where I was at when I heard about it. I remember where I was at when they made the official announcement over the intercom. I remember how people reacted, girls were crying, that kind of thing. I remember I had a pretty big lump in my throat. And I remember very well one of the things I was thinking. One of the things I was thinking, at the literally within minutes of when we knew that John Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas in 1963, I said to myself, we're going to be at war in six months. Why would I think that? Because I believed that there would be a, a foreign element involved. And the foreign element involved would have the United, give the United States to be a target. I could not imagine if a foreign element was involved, there would not be a war. Because the United States would retaliate in very, very forceful means. No, we're going to war. Who killed John Kennedy? You know, you know how many different theories there are? Uh, there's attracted all kinds of things. The mob did it. Okay. The CIA did it. The Secret Service did it. Cuba was involved. Well, we do know, for example, <clears throat> that the U.S. government was trying to get Castro, the dictator of Cuba, killed. Is it possible that if you are, if <clears throat> You think a, a president of a foreign country is trying to kill you, you might try to kill them. We do know that the assassin had links to communism in Cuba. That's not to say that Castro ordered it done. I will say this, however. Had it been known, had there been a connection that was known or proven at that time that Castro or Cuba or any other foreign nation was involved, I can guarantee you the outcry was so ferocious. There was so much fear and anger involved in this assassination that we would have taken them out. Can you say killing your president is an act of war? Now, as we talk about the machinations that went on before we actually have the conflict beginning, <clears throat> there were attempts to say when Austria and Hungary is trying to find out what Serbia was doing. Their Britain said, well, let's have a negotiation. Let's get together. Negotiate what? 
Killing the heir is an act of war. Are you going to negotiate that away? I'm going to be really broad in this. Let's say it's 1941. The Japanese have come over, killed over 2,000 American naval and military personnel at Pearl Harbor, sank five battleships and numerous other craft, and now, now let's negotiate. Okay, let's sit down with the United States and Japan and negotiate. Negotiate what? If someone has knocked off your president, you do not negotiate that away. Well, you find a middle ground, a middle ground of what? So Austria wants to punish Serbia. But you have to say, well, at what level is Serbia guilty? At what level are they culpable? At what level, if at all, was the government officially involved? Now, we've got over a century to talk about this, and a lot of research has gone on. The guilt of, of Serbia has never been proven. Let me make that clear. Serbia's complicity in this culpability, shall we say, has never been proven. We know now about what they knew then, that there were some Serbian officials involved. Serbia knew about the plot. They did. Was there a warning? There was a warning. Was it staged in such a manner that it was a severe warning or something mild? Or You see, they could have made a bigger, bigger deal about this. What is also clear is the Serbians did nothing to stop it. Let's go over here. Does Serbia act guilty? Well, when the assassination takes place, there, there are celebrations all over Serbia. Yay! Um, the government doesn't, might be a little embarrassed by that, but the government doesn't do anything really to rearrange people in. It's, oh yeah, this is great. This is wonderful. Well, that's embarrassing to say the least. Serbia does not go into mourning. There's no statement of regret or grief. Most importantly, even though after Gavilo Princip spills the beans and starts telling people about how they were trained and where they got their money. By the way, the other assassins were not directly involved in either throwing the bomb or in actually shooting the Archduke and his wife, these people are arrested as well. And after a while, they spill the beans. It takes a few days. It takes over a week. Torture is not used. Torture is illegal. So you have to wait until these people literally break down. Now, the assassins were, were supposed to kill themselves. So they could not be interrogated and not lead back to any question of Serbia's involvement. One of them took poison, I believe it was cyanide. It was not good poison. It's made him sick to his stomach and he threw it up. Another man decided to jump in the river to kill himself. So he jumps in the river and it's like two, three feet deep, <laughs> just splash, and he's not drowned. So, so they're, they're captured. Now, there are threads that lead back to Serbia. If Serbia was innocent and tried to say, look, to the entire world, we are innocent, they would run a full investigation, would they not? They would get their intelligence people, they would get their police forces to get into the situation and see exactly what had happened. And they could even start pointing fingers at some Serbian officials that might have been involved. But there is no investigation. If there's no investigation, maybe, well, you're starting to act guilty. Oh, well, yeah, why, why worry about it? We're not going to investigate. We're not going to allow anybody to examine our conduct for fear of what? For fear, for, 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 for fear of guilt? This becomes, a, this becomes a very important issue, particularly in talking about the 10 points in a little while. Okay, let's look at the blank check. <clears throat> Austria is making a case against Serbia. They haven't decided to act. <clears throat> but once again, they have a, an alliance, a very lengthy alliance between Austria, Hungary, and Germany. Germany's their big brother. The Austrians come to the Kaiser. They come to the Germans. 
and say, look, we, we they haven't decided on going to war, but what would you do if we did go to war? You see, the Germans are in a, in, in a tight situation. You see, this is the only, only really friend they have in Europe. It's the only, really only reliable ally. And the Austrians can easily say, well, are we allies or are we not? And if we are, you need to support us. So on, actually the Kaiser was urging the Serbians to do something. It's just Serbians, the, the Austrians to do something. <clears throat> we call this the blank check. On July 5th, the Kaiser says to, to Austria, whatever you want to do against Serbia will probably be justified from, from our knowledge and we will support you in whatever. In other words, this is the blank check. Some people say this is a an advocacy to go to war, and it's not that. It just says, we will back you. We'll, cover you, we'll cover you for what you do. So Austria, of course, can, excuse me, the Austria can choose to do something else. So Kaiser will support its only ally. Well, either you have an alliance or you do not. <clears throat> As the days and weeks progress, we are suspicious in a lot of respects as to what the various nations were thinking. It just so happens that Poincaré, the Prime Minister of France, late in July, a few weeks after the assassination, decides to go in, go to Russia for diplomatic reasons. And of course, they're there, yeah, they're their ally, right? They're there to pat each other on the back and make sure everybody's happy with each other. There's going to be all kinds of accusations by historians and political people during and after the war of what's going on. Is there a secret negotiation? Is there actually a secret attempt to get us into war? There are accusations that, for whatever reason, state papers of Austria in July and August 1914 um, are are lost, unavailable. Well, you can be very suspicious about that, can't you? As far as the major powers are concerned, France, Russia, for example, <clears throat> there are also significant gaps. For example, Poincaré is talking with Russian officials in secret meetings. July 20th to the 23rd, 1914. What's discussed? Quite frankly, we don't know. Usually when you have official discussions, you've got to have some kind of record, not just my memory and his memory. No, no, no. You have to have somebody there taking notes, taking minutes, writing this down to make sure everybody understands later on what the agreements, have, agreements are, but, but no, no notes were taken. Some historians said, well, this is... This is highly significant. Other people say, eh, it's not important. Are they trying to hide something? Because of the fact that nothing, no official notes were kept. Right after this, <clears throat> when Poincaré is going back to Paris, it takes a few days, got to get on a ship up in St. Petersburg, go across the Baltic North Sea, get down to France. However, he sends a notification to all the leaders of the French army that you are going to end your vacations and you're going to get back to your posts as rapidly as possible. Could have a lot of meanings, could it not? Can we imply that maybe they're talking about going to war? A wife of one of the Russian generals met with a diplomat at this time. They're, they're having a state dinner. This lady is highly connected. In fact, the Tsar, Nicholas II, is at that state dinner as well. She turns to this French official and says, oh, by the way, you're going to get alsace lorraine back. And we are going to deal effectively with Austria and Germany. When the diplomat tries to press her for information, she says, oh, oh, oh the... Uh, the emperor, Nicholas II, the Tsar, is looking at me, and maybe I better discontinue this. 
just a frivolous comment at a dinner party? Sure, it could be. But we're starting to see threads that maybe something more, shall we say, sinister was decided between France and Russia. The problem is we don't know. On the 23rd of July, <clears throat> Serbia has found enough information where they believe there's a possibility that Serbia is duplicitous in the assassination. So they send a 10-point ultimatum to Serbia. You've got to answer within two days, 48 hours. In other words, you've got to answer by July 25th. The 10-point ultimatum, some of these things don't make a lot of sense to me. You're going to have to quit in your school system. Quit telling kids how awful the Austrians are. Come on. Yeah, you can say that. I mean, you can go, go to your teachers in schools and say, yeah, don't badmouth the Austrians anymore. So will that change anything? Probably not. Or if they keep their mouth shut this year, they'll start shooting their mouth off again next year. Uh, your newspaper should, should, should stop anti Austrian propaganda, yeah, you can say that to your newspapers if you want to, and maybe they'll quit doing it for a few months or a year, and then they'll back back doing it again. I mean, does it really make a lot of difference? No, these things don't. The one that's perhaps the most important is this, that you've got to run an investigation. Remember, Serbia had not done this. You've got to run an investigation as to the duplicity of various officials in the Serbian government. And the Serbians say, oh, by the way, we're not going to do this. In other words, the Austrians said, Austrian officials will come down and they will work with your people. In other words, the investigating people will be Serbians and Austrians. So the Austrians can make sure what's going on. And when we find the guilty people, the Austrians are going to be there on the ground as well to make sure that these people are properly punished. And Serbia refuses. Can you say this is the most important one of all the things? Serbia agreed to everything but that one. Now, can we say that this is an insult to the national independence? Sure. We can say this is an insult to the integrity of the government. We can say that too. We can also say if you have nothing to hide, why, 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 why not? Well, the one that mattered. Now, very interestingly, when the Serbians agree to every one of these stipulations, except one, the people say, boy, we dodged that bullet. But the Austrians say that this is the one that the most important one uh, you have literally ignored. So, a couple of days later, Austria declares war on Serbia. Declare war on Serbia on the 28th of July. This is the beginning of the First World War. However, it's a war between Austria Hungary and Serbia. We do not have and a, a, the other major powers, Germany, Russia, France, Britain, for example, they're not involved yet. Can we say the first military action of the war, the next day, when the Austrians shelled Belgrade, which is the capital of Serbia. Let's get a map of Serbia up here and give you an idea as to why that's possible. Mm. Does that one work? Belgrade and Grade. This isn't even in English. <laughs> what, you have no cities on this? Okay. <laughs> Any of that. Also, also not in English. Uh, Belgrade is right up here on the border. You know, it's literally across the Danube from Austria. And so it's within artillery range. So you could, so the firing is very easy to do. Now, in the, in the weeks following this, there's going to be an invasion when the Austrians do attempt to invade Serbia. Now, so how do you change this war between Austria and Serbia into a broader war?
Yeah, we got Belgrade here. And as you can see, Belgrade is across the river right here from Austria. Okay. <clears throat> South Belgrade. Let's go, let's keep on our discussion. So Russia backs Serbia. Can ask ourselves why. The Russians ostensibly say pan Slavism. By the way, the Serbs are our Slavic brethren. And we do not want to see them pushed around by the Austro Hungarians. That's kind of the official line. In retrospect, it's easy to say how really interested was Russia in Serbia. I mean, remember, we got the first Balkan War, we got the second Balkan War. Well, and yes, I realize the various nations are fighting with each other down there. And some people said that the Tsar Nicholas II had got egg on his face because as the war goes, those two wars are fought down there, he's asked to intervene. Of course, he has a problem when you have like Serbs on one side and Bulgarians on the other side, you have Slavs fighting Slavs. So how does he intervene in order to help one side or the other? People say that, well, he should have done something. He's criticized for that. Well, yeah, but can we really say what was he supposed to do? Should he become involved now? He knows that if he mobilizes against Austria, let's go back to our Let's go back to our alliances here. I think this is the one we used last time. Notice if Russia is going to go to war against Austria-Hungary, right here. Of course, the Austrian army is going to have to be here and here, because it's going to have to fight Serbia and Russia at the same time. <laughs> Austria is in a pickle. You can, you can get scores in very easily. But if Russia mobilizes its forces to come down here and take out this area, then how about Germany? Germany is closely allied to Austria. Well, first of all, will Germany allow Austria to be cut to ribbons? Will Germany also allow a huge Russian army to be mobilized on its border? really right up here and do nothing. Because if Russia mobilizes here to come against Austria, maybe they can mobilize, use the same forces and plow into Germany. The Kaiser, Willie and Nicky, Kaiser William II and Nicholas and the Tsar Nicholas II are cousins. And they, they, they've had offended correspondence going on like for 20 years. Okay. Willie speaks German. Nikki speaks Russian. So what language do they communicate in? English. So they're communicating back and forth in English. They both speak good English. And the Willie Nikki, you, you were friends with each other. And now Wilhelm takes a look at Russia and says, my goodness, what are you doing over there? So Russia backs Serbia. It announces mobilization. Mobilization means you call out everybody. You call out the troops. You call out the, the railroad. You put the rail system, system going. You take millions of men out of their civilian occupations. You put them in uniform and you rush them to the front. This is enormously destabilizing both economically and socially. You're not going to do this unless you really do mean it because this will paralyze, could severely damage your economy. Russia states that they're going to mobilize. When Wilhelm, Willie, Kaiser William II, hears about this, he immediately sends a shot off to Nikki and says, you've got to stop. 
If you don't stop, this is going to blow up. Now, if you had, if you pin me down to say exactly at what point did this war between Austria and Serbia become a world war, I would argue it's Russia mobilization on July 30th. Now, Russia does say they're backing the Serbians, but look at the eastern border of Russia. The Poles live right here. You got the Germans with East Prussia sticking out over here. You got this enclave of Austria sticking out here. Wouldn't it be easier if you just for Russia if you didn't just have a nice little straight border cutting off these two areas? Yeah. Another issue is, and this has been a big, big issue, going back centuries in Russia, they want access to the Mediterranean Sea by controlling the straits down here. Now, they've never achieved that, even as we speak, much later. But you can see that they have a lot of potential to gain in a war. What do we mean by mobilization? It's mobilization, war. It's not in the sense you're sending bombs over and you're killing people. But it does mean, but it does mean that you're going to war. If that is not the case, whatever country you're, you are associated with, you have to assume that if your enemy on your border mobilizes, that they mean business. You cannot say, wait a minute, maybe they don't mean business. Well, well, you can't allow yourself to sit on your hands and face the possibility of being torched in a war. These are famous statements. Let's go back here. Russia refuses to stop mobilization. France and Russia know this. In fact, France and Russia have been saying this for a long time. Mobilization means war. In fact, mobilization is the declaration of war. See what we have here? Mobilization means war. Mobilization is a declaration of war. Okay. So nations fearing that there is a possibility that if your enemy is mobilized, they're going to go to war. So these are the nations that declare mobilization, this is in order. Serbia declares mobilization first, then Russia, then Austria. Now, Austria had already been shelled in Belgrade on the 29th of July. So they're, they're clearly at war. But they haven't called out all the troops in, for a while. So Serbia, Russia, Austria, France, Germany's last. You see, we can't do this scenario because the time the time frame does not work. You can't say, oh, Russia mobilizes, so Germany mobilizes, so France mobilizes. It doesn't work that way. Russia mobilizes, France mobilizes, and then Germany mobilizes. From the German standpoint, before they have actually called out their troops, they have two belligerent powers that have already essentially declared war on them. But the time frame is somewhat uh, interesting. France gives no assurances. <clears throat> you see, as Russia mobilizes, France, Germany says, my goodness, we, we might have to mobilize, and in other words, we might have to war with Russia. So they turn to France and say, look, I know we, you have an alliance with Russia. <clears throat> if there's a war between Germany and Russia, and apparently there's going to be one very shortly, the war between Germany and Russia, what will you do? Will you remain neutral? And France has no assurances. Of course, you can say that and go to war anyway, can't you? No assurances. In other words, Germany has to believe, or has to fear anyway, that France is going to jump in. So uh, it's, uh, I finally ran this down. Uh, authors were saying that Germany, uh, that France mobilized before Germany. And I want to say, see the exact time frame. Uh, one author said a number of hours. Another author said 
Well, I finally ran it down. It was actually 15 minutes. Of course, remember, we are using radio contact with materials, ideas, literally go the speed of light. So the Germans probably knew even a few minutes before they mobilized. As soon as they found out France is mobilizing, bingo. So Germany declares war on Russia on August 1st. I often look at this like a house of cards. You see, we're just talking a few days here. Where Europe is at war, and then Europe, in, in, excuse me, Europe is at peace, and Europe is at war. I use the analogy of a house of cards. You've got this matrix, and it's built up, and you have all these various nations. Since house of cards is very challenging, and it can be knocked over very easily. You just knock out one of the one of the supports, and the whole thing comes tumbling down. The nations that go to war think that they their national interests <clears throat> are heavily involved here. So, Germany declares war on France, August 13th, and then they invade neutral Belgium and shortly France, af France afterwards on August 1st. Well, we're getting into war now, <clears throat> and I need to talk more about the guilt, who's, who's really involved in all of this. Okay, Britain declares war on August 4th. Germany declared war on Belgium August 3rd. They invade Belgium on August 4th, in the morning August 4th. That afternoon and evening, the cabinet, the prime minister and his people get together and discuss, what shall we do? When they say they're going to go to war, and they do go to war on August 4th, they say, why on earth are we doing this? You see, Belgium has this kind of odd scenario. Belgium was created at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And it was declared that it would remain neutral. And the, the signers, the people like Prussia, which was later Germany, France and Britain, signed this agreement saying that Belgium would remain neutral. In saying this, can you say something that was made 100 years ago? Does it really have a lot of force? Well, we can say it's still in, in force. Can we say there may be some other important agreements or were considered at the time important agreements are going to be ignored over time? Yeah, that, there's clearly, clearly that happens. So Britain declares war on Germany, ostensibly to save Belgium. However, are they really honest in this? Remember, they have an alliance with Russia and France. But the issue is really not so much what's going on in Europe. It is perhaps more so to defend the British colonies. If Britain does not go to war, then what's going to happen to their colonial empire? Uh, France and Russia will not feel obligated in any real sense. Not to bother their empire. Well, so Britain goes to war, this high moral stance, we are there to defend this innocent country. Is this hypocrisy? Now, you have a big issue right here. We have Britain invading France. I said this all wrong. Britain going to war to support Belgium. Are these people, is this really high-minded or is this really hypocrisy? At the same time, at the beginning of the war, there are economic enclaves along the Shantung Peninsula in China that are controlled by the Germans. There are economic enclaves also in China controlled by the British. Well, of course they want to take out the German holdings as rapidly as they can to neutralize these. So they send British combat troops across the land of China. Britain is not at war with China. There's no declaration. China has not threatened them. So they use their combat troops to go across, we're not talking huge numbers of men, to go across China and hit German ideas, hit German holdings, hit Germans, German influences. 
Why is that? If it's illegal for Germany to invade neutral Belgium, why is it Ill, Ill, why is it legal for the right for the German for the British to cross China? Um, hypocrisy. How does if 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 Britain is so high minded, why do they treat Ireland so so very badly? Why do they routinely arrest dissidents, people who are fomenting independence, and have them arrested and sometimes executed? Why does the laws that protect Englishmen tend not to protect Irishmen? During the Boer War, it's 1899-1902, when the Boers, the Dutch people, they're living in South Africa, don't want to be under British rule, so you have a war going on. And one of the ways that the British control the Boers, why they're able to win, is to put the Boers, women and children, into concentration camps. One study I've read said there's like 100,000 of these women and children in these concentration camps, and about 25,000 of whom die. Not only this, but Britain holds one quarter of the globe in chains. It's hard to look at, at the totality of what Britain's doing and saying we're just high-minded people because there's very good reason to believe they're not high-minded. Really, what's the issue here is the defense of the empire and Britain does not want to have a potential adversary controlling the channel, these areas right here. Let's speak, let's go in a little bit broadly. Remember, the Allies are going to say, Russia, France, Great Britain, are going to say, we're here for more reasons, and we're here to defend the innocent, and we're here to stop aggressive war. Yeah, they can say all that. However, in 1914, Italy does not join with Austria-Hungary in the war. They declare themselves neutral. In 1915, I'll come back and talk about this a little bit more later, when they're receiving sufficient bribes, on territory they'll gain from France and Britain. They say, oh, now we're going to attack Austria. There is no. Austria never threatened Italy. They didn't attack Italy. They didn't shell Italy. But if Italy does it, well, it's fine. Something else, also in the same war. Romania's unprovoked attack on Austria. Romania's down here. What do they want? They want land over here. Austria doesn't attack them. Austria doesn't come after them. So they attack Austria. Can you see this is unraveling? Your allies are not all high-minded. Quite frankly, you aren't as well. Let's pick on some other countries. Let's go jump on the Second World War. In 1942, the United States is at war. They're at war with Germany. And the fighting is in North Africa. Fighting's a lot of places. The British are fighting the Germans in North Africa, in Egypt, Libya. However, if the United States wants to get rid of the Germans in North Africa, it's a pretty good idea. They need to deploy their forces against them. And in doing so, well, where are you going to deploy them? See, so across the Mediterranean. Let's give you a sense of uh, of strategic location. This map I used before, I guess it works fine. The Germans are fighting the British over here. If the United States comes behind, that's a pretty good deal. And it works. But we have French Morocco and French Algeria right here. The United States is not at war with France. France had never threatened the United States. France had never hurt the United States. In fact, in 1940, the Vichy regime, which is part of France which Germany did not control in 1940, the Vichy regime is recognized as the official government of France by Franklin Roosevelt, by the Americans. even though we would call Morocco and Algeria French colonies. 
The French say the French colonies are as much part of France as is Paris. So the United States invades in 1942, invades by sea, invades Morocco and Algeria. The French combat troops there fight the Americans. Many men are killed, casualties, fatalities in the hundreds. Some units are disrupted. But wait a minute, we attacked a neutral country. Why isn't that such a big deal? It's a moral issue. Because it's only immoral if your enemy does it. If you do it, it's a military necessity forced upon you by your enemies. If the enemy does it, it's a war crime. We'll talk about the laws of war later. Now we'll come back and address those kind of issues. Can we talk about war guilt? Um, who's responsible for the war? Now, everything dealing with human beings is complicated. I'm sure you know that. Some psychiatrists will tell us that it's, there's not an inherent contradiction. Uh, if there's not an inherent paradox involved, it's not human. Yeah, and people are enormously complicated. Human beings are enormously complicated. But, and his, history, therefore, is enormously complicated. But some historians are willing to say that the issues leading up to World War I are perhaps the most complicated of all historical time frames to try to get us our, a proper understanding. I'm not going to resolve that here. No one has done so yet, and I don't think that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. You as young historians, you want to make a name for yourself. Get yourself a consistent theory as to who's responsible and exactly what happened, and get the historical community to agree with you. Wow, you're going to make a big, big mark. I cannot discuss every theory with you, but let me take a look at some of them. I'm going to put them, shall we say, into three main categories. Let's look at the first one. Three main theories, that's according to me. That we have a chain of events. You see, you've made decisions, sometimes going back many years, before the actual event. In case of this, this. In case of that, this. In other words, you've already set your mind to go in a certain direction. And when you set your mind to go in that direction, when the scenario comes up, you've, you've already made the decision. So we have plans, war plans. This is very famous when Germany has war plans. That Germany says, if there's a war, and I'll talk about war plans later on, war plans on the Eastern Front, war plans on the Western Front. We've got to react, we've got to react very rapidly in order to defend ourselves. So, everybody's fault, no one's fault. One historian, Hugh Trevor Roper, has called this war by timetable. You've got to get going on it. I have a, some sympathy with this, this discussion, this argumentation. <clears throat> and there are countries that say that we will do this in this scenario. But there, but to enact this, there's always a human element. You've got to choose either to enact your former plans or to ignore your former plans. I think there's an element here, but I'm not going to so, go far as to say that this is the one I give the most credence to. Let's look at number two. Germany, this is perhaps the most popular among historians, though not all historians by any means buy into this. It's the German preemptive strike. Now, when you're fighting your enemy, you, you, you degrade your enemy, you put your enemy down, your enemy's a bunch of jerks. And, of course, when the Allies win the war, it's very easy to say, well, look, <laughs> it was their fault all along. They must be guilty because we have to be right, therefore they have to be wrong. To a certain extent, historians do buy into this. To a certain extent, historians do buy into their government, their nation. And you want to agree with the ethos of your government and your people. So let's buy into this and say this is a very important issue, that the Germans were involved, it's the Germans' fault. 
Some people will argue at the end of the war in the famous guilt clause in the Peace of Versailles in 1919, where Germany has to sign, they're literally forced to sign, a document saying that not only is the German nation responsible for the war, but the German people are responsible for the war. Even generations unborn, because they have to be guilty. Everybody has to be guilty to justify the payment of reparations. Huge amounts of money to rebuild the destruction during the war, and, and most importantly, rebuilding the nation of France. They must be guilty. And must be guilty to pay reparations and to free others of guilt. If Germany's guilt, nobody else is guilty. Germany's fault. Cover up facts. Uh, records complete. Now, some historians say, well, the Germans were hiding records. We don't have everything. Other historians have said, look at the records that we see in France and, and other countries. They have much bigger gaps than the Germans have. In fact, some historians say these gaps, as you examine them, aren't really gaps at all. You can even, one well, no, author, I thought this was amusing. He says, we can go and look at the records and see what days and what times the emperor, William II, threw fits. Can we say that Germany feels like they're backed into a corner? Yes. Can we say that they are surrounded by hostile enemies? Yes. Can we say that, however, because they crossed the border first, they are therefore responsible for everything? But do you back somebody in a corner and put a gun to his head and if he resists or he decides to hop forward, is this a statement that he's responsible for defending himself? Let's, are we running out of time? Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting short on time. I apologize for that. I want to discuss this a little more thoroughly. It is abundantly true that particularly after Russia had announced the modernization of their army. But the German high command realizes very strongly that if we're going to have a chance to win a war, it's better to go to war, go to a war soon than to wait for Russia to have this extended power. Well, saying that's a good idea and making it happen are not exactly the same thing. Remember, I'm the Cold War kid. You go back, there are times. You see, before 1949, the Soviet Union doesn't have nuclear weapons, but we do. And when the, when the Russians have nuclear weapons, of course, we have a bigger stockpile of nuclear weapons than they do starting in 1949. Of course, Russia is going to try to catch up. There are military officials, people in NATO, for example, saying that, oh, if we, if we go to war now, we'd have a better chance of winning than waiting for these nuclear nuclear stockpile to catch up. Those kind of things were said. Can we say in debate, as a point of reference? Probably what they're saying was true. But does that mean the United States was trying to figure out a way to go to war in the 1950s and 1960s before the Russians caught up? Probably not. Yeah, we got to be very, very careful before we let Germany off the hook entirely even though we find the military is highly influential in political discussions that was made leading up to war in, in 1914. I'm not prepared to say that they're calling the shots. And I'm not per se, prepared to say that in theory, if they're talking in theory, that turns out to be in fact. And boy, I would like to continue this discussion but in the interest of time, I'm going to have to rein this in. I am not done with this discussion. We will come back and discuss Germany and Russia again in the next lecture. In the meantime, this is lecture number five. And let's get it heated up and have a good time with this next time. In the meantime, whatever you're doing, please enjoy yourself.